Good evening and welcome to the June 23rd session of Owen Sound City Council. It's good to see so many folks here in the uh, public gallery tonight and uh, we have a full agenda so we'll, uh, we'll get right at it. So I would um, <clears throat> suggest that we have a moment of silent reflection, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any additional items for this evening? Councillor Lemon. Uh, yes, Your Worship. I have two items, one dealing with the elevator at City Hall and the other with transit. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Oh, the microphone is gone. <laughs> what's going to happen around here do you <laughs> uh, I have one item uh, just to do with the health fair we had great Councillor Chamberlain yes I have a couple of items that I'd like to compliment people on thank you anyone else uh, I have one item uh, with regards to a special meeting of Owen Sound Council to make decisions around public transit Any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Councillor Chamberlain. Yes, I'll be declaring a conflict of interest with 12B2. Thank you. It's noted. General nature thereof. Pecuniary interest. What is it? It is a pecuniary interest. Oh, it's pecuniary interest in ownership in that building. <coughs> Councillor Body. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a pecuniary interest with regard to uh, one of the bylaws uh, that is listed at 18L. And in, in particular, it's a bylaw number 2014-113 uh, uh, through, my, uh, through my office. I am uh, involved um, um, with parties that may benefit from that decision. So when we're voting on bylaws, I will abstain from that one in particular and be voting on the others. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of council? Seeing none, confirmation of the minutes, please, from June 9th. <clears throat> Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Twaddle, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held on June 9th, 2014, as printed, be adopted. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Resolution moving council and committee of the whole, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Twaddle, that City Council now go into Committee of the Whole to consider public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given, and other business. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. We're now in Committee of the Whole. Uh, we don't have any public meetings this evening, but we do have a couple of deputations. And uh, it's great to see our, uh, very, we have some very special guests here this evening. And uh, this is uh, a send-off, an official send-off to uh, our special Olympians to the uh, Nationals. So I'd invite the coach uh, to uh, come forward, uh, Diane, if you could just give your name and address for the clerk and tell us a bit about uh, the next steps for the uh, Special Olympians and where they're off to. I'm uh, Diane Speed. I live at 2665 3rd Ave, Owen Sound. I'm a head coach actually here in Owen Sound for the swim team. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> So I'm here tonight um, to bring the Owen Sound athletes that are heading off to national games yeah. where we're heading off to Vancouver and BC and we're leaving in how many more days? 14 days. 14 <laughs> more days. So they're on countdown right now. So we're all excited. Um, tonight I'm here to tell you that there are going to be two, 352 athletes, 83 coaches, 19 team members, which will be a total of 554 athletes that we'll be representing and coaches representing Ontario, which we're very excited. Tonight, I'm here to bring six athletes 
that are here from Owen Sound that are heading off to nationals. We have Brian Bennett, Graham Dickey, Jamie Lee Ward are heading off in swimming. I have in, athletic, um, in athletics, um, Sadie Thompson, which is unable to be here to join us. Heather Farrar, they are at a training squad tonight, so they are unable to join us. And I also have Amy Gilcrest here to represent 10 pin bowling. Um, the coaches are uh, Dorothy Gilcrest is um, coaching 10 pin. Ruth Dakin is um, coaching five pin and I'm coaching swimming. I also have here tonight our PTL, which has been looking after all our airplane stuff and everything else is also here tonight representing us. Um, we're having all the provinces are, are here, including the Yukon and the Northwest Territories will be joining wow. us too in wow. Vancouver. So there's gonna be over 2,000 athletes at this. Uh, That's incredible. And all you've done fundraising for a lot of the uh, travel expenses and- Yeah, the athletes had to raise $1,000 each wow. to help put towards this. And we had some fundraiser events and asked, actually the athletes also went around and asked for donations too and raised. Each one of them has raised over $1,000. Wow. And the money that is raised over, The money that has been raised over a thousand will come back to our community account, to each of the community accounts and, and help out the athletes in their training courses. That's wonderful. You know, it's a real, uh, such community of uh, sports and excellence in sports and athleticism. And uh, tonight we're also talking about the Sports Hall of Fame. And I can tell you that there's a, there's a place for each one of these uh, athletes. Uh, the amount of training and the dedication that each of you put into this is, uh, is really something to be very, very proud of. And uh, Owen Sound will be watching and we'll be listening and we'll be uh, expecting that you'll bring us back something, if not lots of smiles, maybe a medal or three or four. <laughs> we'll really look forward to that. Listen, I do have uh, some Owen Sound pins that I would hope that you would uh, wear proudly on your jackets, uh, on your travels. And uh, I would invite uh, all members of council to uh, join with me as we give uh, this group of Special Olympians a send-off to the national competitions where I know they'll do us very proud. Thank you. Thank you Brianna, could you give these to Diane? Thank you very much for coming. And, uh, We'll do thank a photograph you. when you get back. Okay, thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Have a good evening. Good luck. Good luck. I had the pleasure of uh, playing uh, bowl, 10 pin bowling with Amy, and I can tell you that uh, <laughs> she can bowl circles around me, that's for sure. <laughs> And now I'll invite uh, the administrator for the Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area, Carolyn Bigley, to tell us about an upcoming event. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship and Welcome. Councillors. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening. As you know, part of the mandate of the Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area is to market the downtown core. When writing the OSDIA strategic plan, it was acknowledged that a successful way to accomplish this is through presenting events that attract people, locals and visitors, to the downtown. Events provide an opportunity to not only introduce people to the wonderful and unique shops and businesses we have, but also to show that downtown is a safe, fun, attractive and a vibrant place to be. Two of the events that the OSDIA present, which meets all of these goals, is the Hottish Yard Sale, and Streets Live Busker Fest. Hottest Yard Sale Under the Sun is now in its 26th year and will take place Saturday, July 5th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Attracting between 3,000 and 4,000 people, the yard sale, as we like to call it, offers a perfect opportunity for downtown merchants and businesses to showcase their merchandise and services and for attendees to discover and take advantage of all the great things downtown Owen Sound has to offer. In addition to the four blocks of bargains, bargains, people will find at the Hottest Yard Sale that there are several other components to the event. 
This year, we will be partnering with the Owen Sound Police Service to include the Children's Safety Village in the children's area that will be in the 700 block. The backstage, the backyard stage, will be moved to the east side of 2nd Avenue and will host the Bearcats, the Black Family, Rob Ritchie, the Downright, the Sports Writers, and back by popular request, Whiskey Jack. The community stage at City Hall Square will present the Taoist Tai Chi Club, Crazy Sticks, you have to come and see it, Blue Crane Martial Arts, Hit the Beat Dance Studio, Kashka Wyatt, Steel Pan Drummer, and the 8th Street Orchestra. We're also working on having Greg Rowe, Canadian National Trampoline Champion and an acrobatic performance specialist who would be conducting demonstrations in the 1000 block. It's always difficult for us to draw people down to that particular block and we think this is going to do it. So you can see that when organizing the, and programming the yard sale, we make sure that there is something for everyone. Did I mention bargains? Our other very successful event, which also meets all of our objectives, is Streets Alive Busker Fest. This event is spread over two days. The Friday night preview concert will take place August 8th from 7 to 8.30 at City Hall Square. And the main event on Saturday, August 9th, will be from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Streets Alive Busker Fest offers people something different something that piques their curiosity and something they've never seen before and probably not have the opportunity to see if it weren't for Buskerfest. Streets Alive draws in people from nearby towns, tourists who have come up for the summer, and people from away who have just come to see the event. Once they get here, they see all the great stores and businesses and beauty that downtown Owen Sound has to offer. Things will be a little different this year. There will only be one performance space instead of two, and it will be located in the 900 block this year. And while there may only be one performance pitch, the quality of the performers are the same. Back by popular demand is Ryan Opar, and he was the crazy guy last year who juggled chainsaws. <laughs> Also back will be Look Up Theatre, the incredible aerial act, and they're always a crowd pleaser. Ezra the Stilt Dancer will be roaming the street in his many colorful costumes, as you may remember from last year and the year before. New this year will be the Fire Guy, who jumps skateboards through flaming hoops. We hope that might appeal to a certain demographic we have not had an opportunity to attract. Uh, and we're also very fortunate to have the famous rubber band boy all the way from New Zealand. Um, he gave himself that name, famous, so he's a bit optimistic. But you have to see him to believe him. It's just incredible. So in closing, the Owen Sound Downtown Improvement Area would like to thank the city for its financial support and for its continued support with uh, um, recommendations and assistance. And we'd like to invite you to attend Streets Alive Busker Fest and the hottest yard sale under the sun. So bring a hat, it's going to be hot. Bring loonies and toonies to show the buskers your appreciation at Busker Fest. But leave your umbrella at home because it just isn't going to rain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The two dates again for both those events, Carolyn? July 5th is Hottest Yard Sale Under the Sun, right. and August 8th and 9th is Buskerfest. Super. So Great. something for everyone. and Absolutely. You don't have to leave town, and you can invite your friends to town. That's right. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. We are at public question period. Is there any member of the public here this evening that would like to ask a question of this council? Please step forward and say your name and address for the clerk, please. Hi, my name is Peter Ferguson. Um, I live in Kimberley. And uh, we last met when we were trying to decide who was going to bring the ombudsman in. The ombudsman came, determined that you acted illegally. And my, uh, I have two questions. Are you, like Joe Fontana, all going to resign? What's your second question? Well, I'll answer that one first. No. 
that's good because I think as we talked about, it would be really nasty to the people of Owen Sound to leave them without a government at this point. The, um, that means that you're going to be here until the end of your term, presumably. And uh, I wonder then, what assurance can you give us that you will conduct a law-abiding administration in the meantime? How are you going to do that? No ideas? <laughs> How are you going to do that? Mr. Ferguson, we will continue to abide by the Municipal Act of Ontario. We will continue to hold open and transparent meetings and we will continue to, in fact, uh, pay very close attention to the information that we received from the Ombudsman and, uh, and address each and every one of those uh, concerns. Yes, Ms. Bird, I thought, made a lot of good suggestions and I thought maybe you would want to take them up. Um, what you expressed were a series of desires or aspirations. You haven't told me what you're going to do. But I'm sure you can come up with something. So thanks for your time. I'm sorry that things turned out the way they did for you. And I want to say that your staff has conducted themselves in an exemplary manner during this sorry episode. They're very professional and I trust you can meet their standard and I thank the staff for their assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public here that would like to ask a question of this council? Seeing none, we do have correspondence. We have two pieces of correspondence. The first one is the correspondence from the Ombudsman of Ontario, and this was as a result of a closed meeting complaint from March 23rd, 2011. Um, there's a number of recommendations and uh, observations in there. Uh, what is Council's direction? Councillor Adair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Worship. I move we receive the correspondence. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. We will also be um, receiving a um, comprehensive review of the procedural bylaw in the months uh, ahead uh, with, um, with full, um, full account to ensure that all parts from this report are addressed within our procedural bylaw uh, going forward. And we are certainly committed to open and transparent uh, decision making. Thank you. Correspondence from Saeed Rafi, the CEO of uh, Toronto 2015 Torch Relay for the Pan Am Games. Councillor Twaddle. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> I think this is a very exciting opportunity and uh, um, certainly I think we should uh, agree to the request. I would move that we accept the request and agree to be a host city. I, I note uh, today they're launching a campaign. They need to recruit 20,000 volunteers for the Pan Am Games. So that's, uh, that's virtually the entire city of Owen Sound uh, could, could find themselves employed in the Pan Am Games next year. So I mean, this is, this is a pretty major thing and uh, I think it's uh, very close to on a par with um, the Olympic torch relay that came through. And uh, I think the only thing we can assure people is that the weather will be better. <laughs> Warmer, at least. A few degrees. Councillor Adair. I'm just going to say it, 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 it would have to be warmer than it was for the, uh, for the Olympic torch. That was, I think, the coldest night I've ever spent outdoors. Um, so what, what are the next steps for us? We know we had a committee that did the, um, the Olympic torch rally. Um, I know people are starting to get excited in anticipation for this. My, uh, my boys have seen the, the ads as we're watching the World Cup, and they're like, is that going to be in Toronto? Can we go? So, no, we can't go, but Volunteer. We, could, we could go to a torch rally into, uh, into Owen Sound. So I guess, you know, what are the costs? What are the, what are the, the next steps? Who's specifically going to be sure. leading this up? I'll go to the city manager and then uh, member of council. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Through to Councillor Adair. Um, as indicated in the letter, they will be contacting us with further information. We will bring a report once we have that information back to Council. I would just ask that you respect their request to um, keep this fairly low key until the official announcements made um, by the Pan Am Games Group. 
So we will follow up with a report to this council. Further discussion? Thank you, all those in favor, opposed, that motion is carried. Thank you. We have uh, quite a lengthy consent agenda. Um, items 12A1 through, oh goodness, 16. 1 through 16. Councillor Wright. I have a question re the, regarding the business license applications. When a business is, is downtown, if I could through you, and I'm not sure, I think this might go to our Director of Community Services. When a business is already downtown and they relocate up the street or something, do they pay the same rate of a business license or do they get a different rate? Oh, clerk, sorry. Any business that is relocating plays the same rate. The rate ensures that their new location meets all of the standards, including zoning and fire code, before they go ahead with their business. So it's a, a rate for a review process. So it's, it's not different depending where they live in the city. Okay. How come then, if that's the instance, are we sometimes allowing business license after somebody's been open and operating for a month? In certain circumstances, and generally what happens is that provided the zoning is correct, the business is allowed to begin on a temporary basis pending final approval. Quite often, if there are issues like fire occupancy or food-related issues, that business needs to be running in order for those final approvals to be provided. So if they're selling food, for instance, the health unit needs to see them working with the food product in order to give their approval. So the approval that's provided from council is a temporary approval based on zoning, and then they are provided a letter that allows them to begin their, their business pending final approval. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Councillor Boddy. Thank you, Worship. I'll uh, move the consent agenda. It's, uh, as you say, 16 items. Uh, Sydenham Sportsman's um, 27th Annual Salmon Spectacular Emancipation Festival. Uh, new event, Sun Life Financial Get Active Community Day up at Victoria Park. The annual uh, uh, Kennel Obedience Club show at Harrison Park. Rip Fest. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of stuff. And then business licenses, and I think there's about five of those, and it's a whole bunch of stuff all at once. It's a, a pretty mm -hmm. big agenda. It a lot is. of things going on. Sure. Uh, further discussion to the Councillor Wright and Councillor Lemon. Sorry, I had one more question on the business licenses. Then when I look at the three from the, that they, what is the situation there? They've been open and operating for about a year and now they're getting a business license. Through okay. you, Your Worship, we did have an order uh, respecting some in-ground works on that property. We're not normally in the business of issuing business licenses where we have an order, that order has been resolved and, and then we brought the licenses forward. Okay, that's great, thank you. Just curiosity because it was just differences and I was just questioning these. Thank you. Good. Councillor Lemon. Yes, in terms of you notice about the Emancipation Festival, this is the 10th anniversary of the Black History Karen which has achieved international recognition. So it's going to be a very special Emancipation Festival this year. Thank you. Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. Just a question for staff about the Emancipation Festival. I, I believe there's a typo in there. Um, people attending Harrison Park do not have to pay an admission fee. Is that, that's that's correct? correct. Only the people that are attending, attending the, the festival. And the second question, it doesn't mention all the other ones are paying a, uh, uh, a rental fee, or most of the other ones doesn't mention that in here. Are they paying a rental fee? Through you, Your Worship, yes, there is a rental fee. It's just over $70. They book the pavilion for the day on the island, and that is the rental fee, and it is charged to the event. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion on any of the items within the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. We have reports. Our first report and a presentation is from the uh, Manager of Economic Development and Tourism, Mr. Furness, and this is uh, as a result of a council resolution wanting more information on economic development corporations. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, 
I think the, if anyone has any questions about the report, um, I, I try to, it's fairly detailed. I tend to work with uh, my colleagues across the province and talk to numerous models and uh, have for a long time. So I don't necessarily see any advantage or disadvantage of going to an economic development corporation. Um, there are more and more of them happening on a regional basis. But again, you don't need to be a corporation to partner to, to achieve your goals. So. Councillor Dare. Well, I just to thank you, Your Worship. Um, I had been uh, I who had moved the motion and asked for for this because we've been talking about economic development corporations, and so I wanted to know what mm -hmm. what is it? What are the advantages? It seems to me that um, our economic development advisory committee that is made up of uh, quite a few of the stakeholders in in the community seems to be the way to go for a community our size. Um, so I would certainly move that we receive the report. There's some good information in here. It was rather uh, an interesting read, but it seems that we're, you know, for for who we are, we're following best practices, and and that's good. Mm -hmm. Councillor Body. The only thing I was going to add is I noticed that um, uh, there used to be tax advantages of it being a corporation or, or grant advantages to get grants and things that were uh, uh, municipalities are on the same page now. So I would imagine some of these corporations were probably incorporated at that time for that specific reason. And uh, that's one of the reasons it's eliminated to go to a corporate uh, style of economic development. Uh, we've got, as the report sets out, we've got members of uh, just about every facet of our, our business community coming to our economic development meeting. We've got uh, different agencies, uh, provincial funded agencies and things that are there to help business and uh, we're achieving a lot without changing the umbrella that we stand under. It's, uh, we're doing the same thing that they'd be doing as a corporation in some of those other places. So we're in good shape. Councillor Chamberlain? Yes, and if I could just compliment this uh, along the same lines. Uh, I understand, you know, our work with the uh, uh, business centre with Jane Phillips is working out very well. There's a lot of growth within our own area around that part. Uh, some of our, our businesses are growing and we really do have a positive message about what's happening with economic development and in cooperation with the county and we maybe can just get reports from time to time about what's going on with all the economic development officers. Uh, absolutely. I mean, one of the, one of the things that a good request like this comes is you get to go and take a look. And, you know, I was always, we sometimes struggle with the size of our committee, uh, but it's a healthy committee and, of course, there are some other economic development corps and other organizations that have just as large a committee. Um, I was, it was pointed out to me by one of my colleagues that it's rare in a large urban to take representatives from who we have on our committee and do that in a large urban. It would be quite a task to do that. But we tend, because of our size of a community, can do that. We can bring representatives from the manufacturer, college, Blue Water School Board, and the list goes on. So it, while it sometimes is a challenge to get everybody's view, I think the key is cooperation at all level, whether you're within a corp corporation or not. And that really is a common theme for advancing economic development, whether you're in Owen Sound or Gray County or Gray and Bruce or SWEA or Ontario, so. Councillor Burden. Yes, I think uh, just to, to say from the perspective of a committee member on the Economic Development Committee, I think that there's real advantages to the committee structure as opposed to a legal entity that's a corporation. Um, there's very rich discussion from very many different perspectives at that committee. Um, and I think because we're not a legal entity as a corporation, we can kind of think together uh, without having to run certain risks that you do when you're in a, a corporation. Uh, so I think the committee is working very well. If it wasn't, then maybe that might be something you would consider, but it's, it's a, a strong committee and, and working very well. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lemon. Uh, Sorry. Right. One of the things about this is the system we've got is effective. Uh, it listens to the community. It listens to the business community. It's flexible which is also something you don't always get with when you have a formal corporation. And there was an old adage a mechanic told me many years ago, if it ain't broke, don't try to fix it, because you'll probably do more damage than you'll do good.
And I think this is one of those cases where it is working and working well and has in this format and there's no economic advantage to forming an economic or a, a corporation except there is an expense of incorporating and all that stuff. But what do you gain? I don't think you're going to gain anything. Any further discussion or questions from members of council? I have to agree with the, the majority of council that what I've heard tonight, the, uh, the system is working well. I think for a community our size, the, uh, the very small budget that we have allocated to economic development is uh, we, we get more bang for our buck than a lot of municipalities that are uh, that have budgets, you know, five and ten times what we have currently. So I think every member of council, as well as staff and the entire business community and residents, we all play a really important part in economic development in in our own circles of influence. And as we go out and meet with different organizations, meet with different businesses, uh, we too can really affect investment in our community. Uh, we've seen it happen. You'll hear more about it as the weeks and months go on, but we have had significant uh, investment in our community in a few very, very short years, and it is through very strategic, focused approaches that, uh, that we seem to do best. So uh, thank you, Steve, for this report. Um, there is a recommendation, and that is to receive the report. Uh, what is Council's... Uh... Oh, you did. Thank you, Councillor Adair. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. And now you get the presentation. Yes. So it was good timing, I think, to, uh, I think Councillor Boddy had asked for an update on our economic development strategy. So I'll move through this quickly, efficiently. So uh, our economic development strategy, we're going to talk a little bit about it, best practices, and the, the flow or logic chart that we followed, this is a format that the provincial government um, was um, in, instrumental in, in presenting last year. So uh, the city strategic plan talks about an area of focus at economic development of attracting people, business and organizations, growing existing businesses and making laws and, and policies to encourage responsible growth. This is, these are terms you've heard before. Uh, our rural red projects were significant. They're completed. We're now moving forward with a new strategy based on best practices. Um, and so one of the things we heard on the Ontario Rural Institute has published priorities. And what you'll see over the last four years in rural on on Ontario is a wide range of issues that are affecting economic development. Broadband, health care, physical stability. These are different than large urbans. And while we are an urban center, we are in a rural area. And I like to call us a rural, a rural urban. So the issues that are facing us, we're not alone. We're, we're the same across the rest of Ontario, except um, in, in terms of the rural part of the province. We did a retention and business expansion survey in 2010, and the three top priorities there at that particular time raised by the business community was our business taxes were too high, downtown parking, and a more, being more business friendly. And the response, we've seen a 14% decrease in our commercial taxes. Um, Mr. Ritchie gave a presentation to our Economic Development Committee on last, uh, last week. Uh, we have a DI, a an agreement with DIA on parking, so there's less meters. And our development team approach is working. We've seen policy reviewed, and we are getting positive feedback from developers. OMAFRA programs, they're the specialists in rural economic development. These are their seven programs that they promote. We have been involved in five of them. And in fact, when you go to the plus side, our Small Business Enterprise Center, which was done through AMAFRA, is now receiving, through all the programs that Ms. Jane Phillips applies for, is over $450,000. Um, I almost don't want her to apply anymore because I don't think she's been turned down on a single program. So we're looking at how to deliver that program and we're looking at maybe adding some more resources. And of course, the Rural Red funding, which we had, uh, was significant and I would say to council that that's an, uh, there are some good funding programs uh, out there. The, the province has done, I think, uh, there's a good a range of programs to consider. Uh, at the EDCO conference, which is the Economic Development Conference for Ontario, 
this is a leading survey that was done of businesses. The number one issue stated by 31% was a shortage of workers. And in fact, had a discussion today with one of our major employers, and that continues to be one of their challenges. General state of the economy, foreign competition. So we tend to see and hear different statistics bantered out, but this was done across, uh, across Canada. That number of shortage of skilled workers is actually quite a bit higher in Alberta and BC. But generally, that's, uh, those are the same issues we hear. So best practices in terms of investment attraction. Trish Grant is the Director of Investment Attraction for the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade. You have to know your value proposition. There's no sense running to a trade show if you're going to come third or fifth or 100. So if you're going to go and compete with other economic development organizations or economic development corporations, whether it's Stratford or London or Toronto or Kingston or Burlington, you got to know what your competitive position is. The uh, editor of uh, Foreign Direct Investment magazine says it's, it, you're not really, you're doing consultative selling. You're, tr so you're problem solving for businesses and sectors. So find out what sectors you're competitive in and then research them. And 80% of new investment flows into existing plants. And we've seen that in both our major plants, Tenneco, RBW, even Hobart's and others. So you got to know your strengths and you got to influence the influencers. These are the best practices uh, as stated by the experts. So the overall conclusions are rural priorities are different than urbans, so you have to come up with your own unique strategy. You can't copy someone else's. Population is slower. We have to be a welcoming community. The growth in the Ontario's population is going to come through new Canadians and immigration. So you better be a welcoming community. Job growth is going to likely come through existing firms. Labor force is still a big issue. And investment attraction based on competitive position. So labor force a big concern. That's why Georgian College is a very important part of not just growing the college, but our whole economic development strategy and future. So our economic development strategy. So three areas, pride of place, quality of life, business retention and expansion, and investment attraction. That's how we are grouping our three, uh, under three categories. And the outcomes that we're looking for three to five years is a growth in population and assessment growth. And the photo on the bottom is junior achievement, uh, cutting ribbon with the mayor at Alexander School. This is a new program that, that the community has come up with and is implementing, and I think it's, it's a very positive side. So attracting quality of life. So a few years ago, we had a brand, Where You Want to Live. It still resonates today. There was a marketing strategy that Saj Jamal came up with. Many of the tactics we're still following. We'll probably want to review that next year. But going to external shows, the Zoomer show, the Cottage show, the Real Estate show, we're going with developers and Gray County. They've been quite successful. The picture on the bottom is the Salmon Derby, gentlemen. They are using our banners and promoting our, our logo. They go to 20 different trade shows. It costs me the, uh, the brochures on the table and the aprons. So welcoming community is another priority. So we have a number of projects along that. Live Great Bruce is a website that promotes job availability and those interesting to move back into the area. We're having a youth video contest based on the last time we did that. That was, we had some outstanding commentary from young people on, the, on why they like to live here. We're going to continue to take ads out on select magazines and a more of a focus on, on website and, and social media. Um, in tourism, we have over 100,000 pieces of, of publications when you think about our vacation guides, our map, our restaurant guides, Harrison Park guides. We're doing some particular advertising, but it's linked. Advertising is not just print now, it's web and it's social media. So we're doing all those. Um, we're hoping to get some new webcams, depending on the technology at Ingalls Falls and the Mill Dam, although there's some technical challenge. I'm working with Jamie on that. And we're expanding the number of videos that we have on offer. So when someone Googles on sound and they want to see what we are um, or doing visually, in fact, I think today there was a private video put on about two waterfalls that uh, Shelley posted. I don't know if you saw them. They're <laughs> pretty remarkable. They were done one of, with one of those flying cams. And of course, the salmon run, we're growing, um, and it'll be even bigger. The partnerships there with the Sydenham Sportsmen, Georgian College, and uh, the Conservation Authority. 
So business retention and expansion. So the centerpiece to business retention is our business enterprise center. The business enterprise center has over a thousand uh, inquiries a year, 360 consultations, that's one a day. That's an hour long consultations and over 68 business seminars. That's more than one a week. I think that's a little much, but Jane keeps going. So uh, lots of resources there at the Enterprise Center. Retention visits we continue to do with our major employers. The Creative Mixer event, that's the invitation. The first one went very well. The next one's July 9th at RBW and at Georgian College. It's about getting those creative people in our community that are employed, living locally, but creating their wealth through the internet or through their creativity. And you don't necessarily see them or know them. It's not like a big plant, but they are here and they're growing and there's some interesting, their needs are very unique. They're, they're unlike the traditional business. Uh, we've had a round table with the DIA on landlords that was quite successful. I thought it was quite interesting to hear the comp very, very positive comments from our, our downtown landlords. And we hope to have another one in the health and education sector. And of course, we're supporting in this area, very important to support, to support Gray County's SWIFT initiative with fiber to the home. And of course, Gray County is leading SWIA um, in, that, in that project. Investment attraction, you must have a clear advantage. Most foreign direct investment is coming into Toronto. It's coming in through sectors that we do not have a competitive advantage in. Software, business services, financial services, communication. So you have to be clear on where you're going. Best practices for getting lead generation are aftercare of your existing businesses, attending conferences, seminars, and websites. You can do some outsourcing, but it's, uh, it has to be very focused. So this is a picture of me. I'm in um, Toronto at an international, um, uh, meeting the international trade reps that are in our embassies. Um, not necessarily going to help some of our bigger players, but certainly going to help a lot of our smaller players who are into exporting. Already hooked uh, one of our people up to uh, the Brazilian team, so I'm going to continue to do that. So our target areas are call centers. That's because of our labor force. Data centers, um, they need a cooler climate, absence of natural disasters, so we don't have earthquakes or hurricanes. Um, Georgian Bay is one of the appealing factors, using Georgian Bay as a cooling, cooling agent. So I've met with a few people and I'm going to continue to meet and understand that, that particular opportunity. Uh, attracting the film industry, we had some local people come forward from the first creative mixer who wanted to take a look at this. They think that we have the natural beauty and the local talent, so we're working with them to put a resource package together. And oddly enough, how we might team up with the City of Toronto. Toronto lands a lot of films. They don't necessarily have everything, and they might be able to partner with us on some of the things we do have. One of the things we do have is snow in the winter. Toronto doesn't necessarily have snow. That came from, yeah, anyway. So um, that's an interesting one. I don't know where, where how, we're gonna knock on doors shortly with that, but um, it's an interesting opportunity led by some local business people. The harbor, um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the harbor. You've probably know my views. I think it's one of our most significant strategic assets that we have. And regardless of what we do in the next 100 years, it's still be there. It's not something that they're gonna move. It is linked to resource development and manufacturing. And I do think the more I talk to others, I think there will be an opportunity around the ring of fire. You heard the premier talk about that, that huge resource development in the north. Of course, smaller manufacturers, I think, will have an opportunity now that the PPG building is now under local ownership and the Goodyear plant, hopefully, shortly. So it allows us to work with those land owners to market those properties. Retail box stores will continue to uh, work with this area. I think this is a particular opportunity, although retail sector is changing rapidly and reaching out to the GTA real estate agents who are becoming very, very specialized and understanding what we have. And of course, waterfront property is another huge opportunity. The issue we have to focus on is, is working on demonstrating a market. I think the downtown condos will help with that. And the new construction standards that they're talking about bringing in next year, being able to go to five or six stories under wood constructions has a lot of advantages from a weight perspective. When you think about our waterfront, 
we have some soil conditions, not from an environmental point of view, but more from an engineering point of view. So uh, we're going to continue to attend networking events. Uh, these are some of the events I attended. These are our trade reps across uh, the country. They have programs where if we have an exporter that wants to go and go to Brazil and figure out who they might meet there, they can have time in the embassy and they'll give them a, an office and desk space. So it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity for those looking to export. Future, we'll be looking at a retail conference, the real estate show that's here at Owen Sound locally, and industrial real estate agents. So these are some of our announced investments. And I think the important thing is that we do have investment being announced. We want to continue to grow that investment. The picture here is the presentation we had at our economic development meeting from the Fire Med Center, Georgian College. This will result in a lot of hotel nights and corporate visits. Uh, and they seem quite confident moving forward. And of course, the court building and jail building, the water reservoir, and the CP Rail and the other city properties. In conclusion, our economic development strategy is based around pride of place and quality of life. That is our competitive advantage. It's our advantage we use to attract small business and retirees and families. Business retention is working with our existing businesses and investment attraction is reaching out. And we will be taking more of a focus. We have time. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, we're open to any new suggestions that come forward from the committee and new opportunities come forward all the time. So we have to be ready. Of course, I think it is worth recognizing that Gray County has spent a lot more time and energy in, the, in economic development and we're working cl more closely with their group and I think they're getting their feet under them and they're going to be developing their own strategy and they're going to be announcing a consultant in July and I look forward to that. Sorry, that may be a little long. Right under the wire. Thank you very much for the presentation and I'm sure Council will have questions or comments. Council Wright. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve, the county has a steering committee set up and there's five businessmen on that committee from around the, the county. And the comment was made from one of the largest manufacturers in the county that his hydro in five years has gone up 500%. And if it continues to go up the way it's going in the province of Ontario in 10 years, there won't be any industry left in the province. Are you getting any complaints about the cost of hydro here? Absolutely. Uh, at our economic development meeting, that was mentioned by one of our largest employers. And in fact, at the Excellence in Manufacturing Consorting Consortium, uh, they had their golf tournament. My colleague out of Brockville uh, is causing quite a wave because this, this, uh, the neighboring state is walking in and trying to poach firms mm -hmm. specifically on the uh, reduction in power or the savings in power. And it's not just 10%, it's like 60%. So it is a very big issue and it's a very big issue. It's one, it's one the manufacturers will call it's an uncontrollable cost and, and it's not something that they go and analyze and can figure out. So it is a, a challenge for them. So is there anything we can do? Can we, is there anything we should be doing to lower those costs? I mean, can we get in touch with AMO or can we, Absolutely. Can we write a letter down to the premier and, and tell them? I mean, the costs of hydro are going to kill our industry right. and our community and, and we, need, we need the industry. Well, and not only does it, it hurt existing, but it certainly impacts anyone who's looking. Um, data centers, you know, they need connectivity, they need power, and that's one of the things they look at. Do you have power and what's the price of it? So in that, that when they're re reviewing where they're going to locate, it's an issue. So I know the Excellence in Manufacturing Consortium has a buying group where they can get a reduction if they join and they have certain, certain volumes, uh, but that's certainly something we could look at and, and um, I can talk further with uh, my colleagues in, in the province and we can certainly write the Premier or the Minister. Well, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of doing that and if, can we just make that suggestion or do we need a motion? You can do it through a motion or you can do it through a suggestion and I can guarantee you that that, mo that message will be taken forward well, quite I'll, clearly. I'll, I'll just do it, um, well then I'll put it on the floor as a motion sure. that, we, yeah. that we get in touch with uh, whomever uh, that uh, Steve or thinks mm -hmm. and, uh, that we send a letter mm -hmm. under our mayor's signature complaining uh, really that we are really, I mean they need to consider the cost right. of, of hydro 
or we're going to lose industry up here. We're going to lose industry in the province big time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, Councillor Lemon. I certainly support the motion, but it's not just industry that's affected by these hydro rates. It is individuals within the community, and oftentimes it's the people who least can least afford it. So we've got to get the Ontario government to straighten up the Ontario hydro mess yet again. The motion is um, specific to, uh, to industry sector and uh, rising costs of hydro. It does. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. I'll take that forward to AMO as well as Southwestern Economic Alliance. And to our main, our main MP. MP and MPP. Or awesome. MPP. And awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation and I look forward to seeing uh, all the council, everyone at the July 9th Creative Mixer. I'm going to talk to some of those um, programmers about thinking about putting on an on sound hack fest, uh, which is uh, an opportunity for uh, the development of public domain um, apps and uh, contests and so on. So uh, we can't, <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> we are uh, talking now about land fate, land fill. Oh no, we're in encroachment agreement, Sydenham Properties Inc. 12B2. What's Council's direction on this? Councillor Wright. I will, uh, I will move the recommendation. I, I don't know whether um, our Director of Community Services want to speak to it. This is about putting flower pots and a, and, uh, a walkway and, and things that are going to bout up butt into the street. But I think it's um, certainly appropriate that mm -hmm. it'll make that unit look nice. So I'm, I'm in favor of that. I'll move the motion. Sure. Well, this is certainly moving along. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. We have a report from the purchasing agent, and now we're talking the uh, landfill leachate haulage uh, agreement. Council's direction on this is uh, a word at um, contract to a Region of Heronia Environmental Services, the lowest compliant bid. Councillor Purden. Yes, I'll move that uh, we adopt the resolution to award this to the Region of Huronia Environmental Services. Okay. For leachate. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, presentation for the Manager of Parks and Open Space, Mr. John Howard, with regards to the Emerald Ash Borer Plan. And that pesky thing is uh, is really here with us, and we're happy that you're here, Mr. Howard. No, no reflection on you as the pesky thing. <laughs> I'm referring to the emerald ash borer. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, based on the spread of this exotic invasive insect, um, obviously it was necessary to uh, develop a, a management plan, and the uh, the plan covers uh, a 10-year period. Um, inventorying, uh, oh, sorry, while you're getting techni technically um, uh, oriented there, I just wanted to comment, if I may, on behalf of Council, um, how wonderful the, the parks and all the turf uh, throughout the city, uh, the gardens and whatnot, they're, they're just looking terrific. And uh, they're really keeping up, uh, keeping up well with them. Thank you very much. So the plan is, um, there's the pesky little devil right there that's uh, much larger than it is, thankfully. Um, it's not that big. Um, the plan, as I said, covers a 10 year period. Um, basically the uh, first step is inventorying, um, which goes along with uh, monitoring and assessment. Uh, we're looking at uh, the report covers treatment, uh, tree removal and planting. Um, and of course from the removal, so there'll be wood waste and we've got to look at how we're disposing of that. And a big part will be uh, public education and uh, communication. And as far as the uh, background, um, following the experience of other uh, municipalities uh, south of us, 
uh, we need to develop an effective and responsible and financially viable plan to control this um, emerald ash borer. Um, the management plan we've structured is to preserve the city's urban forest and to sp slow down the spread and delay the impact of, of the emerald ash borer. Um, it will also allow time to introduce um, control measures. Uh, obviously, with anything, we have to monitor costs, and it's difficult to do without an inventory. Um, uh, Council very nicely gave us $30,000 committed to Emerald Ash Borer for this year in our capital budget. Um, but unfortunately, costs are going to increase significantly over the next five to ten years based on what has happened in other centres across the province. Um, Long-term estimates, we're looking at greater than a million dollars. Um, the first step in managing anything is to uh, prepare an inventory or an assessment of the total numbers, the volume, the size of the items to be managed. Um, and it's hard to predict the cost of management of the insect over the next 10 years, but based on the experience of towns, in, uh, in, as I said, we've based it on towns and cities to the south. Um, in the uh, report, in terms of the introduction, um, obviously it's to protect the city's urban forest and it depends on continued management of the city's valuable uh, tree canopy. But a lot of people think, and we are blessed here in Owen Sound with a lot of trees with the escarpment, um, but uh, even the, the street trees and the trees in our parks are, are very vital. Um, there, there's a potential for a large scale uh, loss of ash trees. Uh, from this insect and um, the replacement of the ash is obviously going to be with uh, alternative species is going to be critical. Um, I'm not going to bore you with another biology lesson. I think I did that in this room uh, a few months ago. Um, but it is important that obviously we understand the, uh, the life cycle and where we stand. Uh, there was some information going around thinking that we had such a cold, harsh winter that it had effect on the emerald ash borer. But the information that I've received uh, from Canadian Food Inspection Agency and others, um, where they did tests in Minnesota where it was a lot colder than it was here, um, and the little buggers are still surviving, unfortunately. Um, as, <laughs> as far as uh, it, the report, we're, we're looking at a, as I say, a 10-year um, plan. And uh, this um, um, chart uh, basically is what has been predicted for uh, ash tree mortality from 2014 to 2023. And you see that it, uh, it takes a, uh, a really steep uh, climb to about uh, 2021 and then it drops. And unfortunately that is a prediction that there won't be many ash trees left for the emerald ash borer to feed on. So um, the, uh, the rate, of course, will level off, but unfortunately we will have, have lost um, a, a large part of our, our urban canopy. Um, again, I've, uh, in the report, we talk about the regulation of pests and the responsibilities. Um, and uh, as of April 1st of this year, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency um, has um, considered the widespread of the insect that's no longer a uh, quarantinable uh, pests in this area and they were trying to control its movement into other areas in northern Ontario and across Canada and unfortunately the latest information is that it um, looks like it's bearing on Winnipeg from the south from the states um, and of course they've got their problems out there they're, they've had elm uh, they've survived it with the elm uh, trees but now they're going to lose their, uh, their ash so as far as roles and responsibilities, it's every level of government's responsibility to um, be involved in the control of the emerald ash borer. Um, we are here in uh, the Owen Sound area. Um, I'm on a committee with the uh, Gray Sawbow Conservation, the Saugeen Conservation, and uh, Gray County and Bruce County. And um, we've been uh, um, sharing information. We put on a... Um, a seminar or workshop which was very well attended um, down in the south end of the county back on April the 7th and uh, it was amazing to me the number of uh, municipal representatives that weren't really up on what, what exactly this insect was going to do. 
So there's a number of impacts um, as far as environmental impacts. Obviously, um, it's going to reduce shade. Uh, we're going to, it's going to affect our air quality, um, reduce our oxygen supply, um, reduce our carbon sequestering. And according to Environment Canada, on average, one tree produces nearly 260 pounds of oxygen each year. So we've got to think of these trees as little factories, little uh, you know, production plants of oxygen. Two mature trees can provide enough oxygen for a family of four. And so the loss of these mature trees will have a detrimental effect on our, uh, on our communities and on um, the whole of the environment. And uh, one other uh, statistic, um, one acre of trees annually consumes the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent to the production that, that produced by driving an average car 41,843 kilometers. So we've got to give a little bit more respect to our trees. Economic impacts, uh, studies show that uh, slowing the spread through treatment reduces the overall costs. There were studies done um, by McKinney and Pedler and they concluded it takes 10 years of EAB treatment to equal the cost to remove and replace a medium-sized ash tree. Uh, however, when including all the benefits of a medium-sized ash tree, it would take over 20 years of EAB, EAB treatment to equal the cost to remove and replace the tree. Uh, calculations do not take into consideration recognized tree benefits such as I've just been talking about tr uh, property values, energy savings, and all those other good things that we get from uh, trees. As far as social impacts, um, there's a proven correlation in the decline in the quality of life in communities with fewer trees. Um, they've actually had a study done in the States and they've said there was an increased mortality related to cardiovascular and lower respiratory system related to tree loss. So the research continues uh, for the fast past few years, it has continued into a, a variety of control measures. Currently, though, there's only one insecticide, triazin, which has been registered for control. It's a class four pesticide, which makes it a very um, low toxicity um, pesticide. It's systemic, which means that we inject it in the tree and it travels throughout the tree. Um, and uh, the injections are proving to last up to two years. Um, the results that have come out of uh, Oakville has been leading the way on this. They've been doing it since 2008 when it was just an experimental material and they are having 95 to 97 percent uh, effectiveness. And here's an example of a uh, subdivision. Um, those aren't maple trees in the, uh, in the back. The, the uh, front tree is a ash tree. Um, and the one at the back has been treated with, uh, with triazin. And um, you can see the, uh, the difference. Um, as I said at the onset, monitoring, uh, we've been doing monitoring as much as we can and it's great that we have our new uh, aerial truck. Thank you very much. Um, because we can get up into the tips of the trees and do some um, um, sampling of the, uh, of the uh, branches to find the, uh, the uh, larva stages. Uh, once they are found, uh, there's a combination of treatments for the removal uh, and reduce the spread of emerald ash borer. Um, its experience has proven that uh, once there's a visual symptoms, uh, the tree is already heavily infected and the vascular system, uh, because of the way that the, uh, the larva um, chews that under the bark, that the, um, the tree's vascular system is damaged and therefore applying the, uh, the chemicals like triazin uh, really don't um, work as effectively, if at all. So the uh, guiding principles of the uh, plan, obviously we've got to ensure public safety because when these trees uh, die, they die fairly quickly. At first, they're, it's really slow for about the first two to three years and then they'll go very quickly and they become very brittle. Um, so obviously uh, safety and uh, minimizing liability is very important. Um, so the management plan is structured to preserve the city's urban forestry, but obviously we've got to keep those things in mind. Um, 
We want to slow down the spread and uh, the resulting devastation and allow for the preservation of high value trees, um, which could hopefully be a potential future seed source. And developing a tree inventory, as I said, it's a critical first step uh, towards that. Um, on Friday, uh, our committee that I just mentioned, we met, and um, Bruce Nuclear actually uh, contributed $5,000 to the um, uh, traps that we'll be putting up. We've had a trap down in Harrison Park for about the last three or four years. All it is is a sticky sort of prison that hangs up in the tree. And basically, all kinds of things stick to it. And you go and look, and you see if you can find an uh, adult emerald ash borer, and then you know you've got it in the area. And um, so we distributed those on Friday out from the uh, uh, Great Sauble Conservation uh, area. And uh, we'll be doing monitoring using that type of very basic equipment. Now, as far as the plan options, um, there are basically three options. Actually, there are four. Uh, the fourth one I didn't include in our plan because it uh, is, uh, I think, uh, it's not realistic. Uh, basically, it's, we cut down every ash tree that we can find and therefore the insect has nothing to feed on. Um, it's, it's not realistic. So we have a number of uh, management options. Um, the status quo is do nothing and I don't think that's an approach to take. Uh, option two is that we treat all the ash trees and I don't think we can afford that. And so option three is the hybrid uh, plant. So we said we've got these three options and we're recommending option number three. It's the best combination of cost and benefits, uh, best quality together with significant and or specimen ash trees will be treated. Um, street trees will be removed and replaced with different species of trees where uh, necessary. And um, the potential treatment cost reductions for option, option two and three um, are there if future uh, brings increased control by natural predators. Uh, the information I'm getting right now though is that in the 10 years of this plan, um, the predators that they have started using in the states and we're seeing actually some uh, natural predators such as um, woodpeckers and a non-stinging uh, um, parasitic wasp, um, by the time their populations get up, um, it's going to be on beyond this 10 year period. So um, we're going to be looking at plan implementation. Uh, we've we started in 2014 with the uh, money we've got through the capital uh, budget. Um, and uh, if we haven't found emerald ash borer in Owen Sound yet, it's the closest it's been found is in uh, in Meaford. Uh, there was a suggestion last week that there was a suspicious um, insect just outside of town in Georgian Bluffs, but that hasn't been confirmed. Um, and uh, we obviously are going to be reappraising our situation um, based on the inventory data that we'll be uh, getting, and we will be planning removals um, through, the, uh, through the season. So in conclusion, um, Obviously, the plan is based on estimated numbers, which um, uh, they're just estimates on sizes and conditions. Um, using some of the money from the, uh, um, the budget, we have uh, retained Natural Resource Solutions Limited of Waterloo, and they will be conducting inventory on the city trees um, starting, I believe, on July the 5th. So you'll see somebody wandering the streets with a uh, looking up at trees. And this inventory will include um, GPS location of the trees, uh, their distribution, a condition assessment uh, of the trees, and they're doing all the trees. They're not doing just the ash trees, which would be very helpful in terms of our managing of the, um, of the uh, urban forest. And um, depending on how close I was with my estimate of the number of street trees, um, we have an op second option that they will move in and do what I call the cultivated areas of the parks. Hopefully, you know, the main part of, of uh, Harrison Park and of um, Kelso Beach. And um, so they will be uh, uh, monitoring uh, the, uh, or at least doing the inventory of the trees. We are continuing the monitoring using the branch sampling, uh, the trap placements. Um, actual total numbers of the ash obviously are going to impact our costs for the future and uh, the location of the ash. Um, needs to be identified 
uh, for uh, potential exposure and risk. Um, with the location of all the ash trees uh, and determining their ex potential, uh, we may have be taking down trees that people think are, well, there's nothing wrong with that tree, but we have to look, as I said, when the tree dies, it becomes very uh, brittle um, and uh, it could impact um, property, it could impact um, people's health and safety. And so when we're looking at it, we're looking at the location and the setting will impact um, as well as um, you know, the other uh, factors that I've gone over. And I think that's the end of my report. Thank you very much. I'm sure council members will have questions. Councillor Twaddle. Thanks very much, Mr. Howard. <clears throat> um, I think we've, we've known for several years that this is coming and there's just, I mean, there's just, there is no way to stop it. Um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency has basically thrown up their hands and said you can't quarantine it anymore. Um, we, we've had this presentation at committee and some discussion around it. It seems to me that the, the real issue here is, is a generational one. There's at least a generation and perhaps two generations where the tree canopy is going to be significantly affected. I mean, we can we can treat the trees, very expensive, so you're going to treat them strategically. Um, I think there needs to be a recognition that a lot of the trees just aren't going to be saveable. That's right. Um, but I think that the key to any plan going forward is to begin now with, a, with an aggressive tree planting program um, of species that are not susceptible so that over the next 10 years as the trees die off, at least there's a generation of trees mm -hmm. coming along. We're gonna lose 30, 40, 50, 60 year old trees. Um, it's gonna take that long to replace them. And you were talking about the benefits and how much oxygen they produce and how much carbon they sequester and how much carbon dioxide they consume. Um, so we really need to be talking about two for one, three for one in terms of plantings and we need to be encouraging the residents in the community to plant more trees. Now, I understand the city manager got a really good deal on trees at <laughs> Conservation Authority sale. Um, so she's doing her part. Yeah, she's doing her part. But I think, um, you know, there are some, some affordable options for people to, to take some initiative here <clears throat> and, and look to the future and really think ahead a generation or two. And uh, I know that's part of our plan, and I th but I think it needs to be quite aggressive in order to really make it, um, to make it effective on into the future because I don't think there's any doubt we're gonna lose a significant number of trees. You're talking about street trees. You're not talking about ash trees that are on private property. You're not talking about ash trees that are in bush lots. You're not talking about ash trees that are in the undeveloped or more naturalized areas of our parks and open spaces. No, I certainly am, but yeah. basically I'm responsible for the, I'm not responsible for private property, but no, obviously no. that public education piece is very important. But that's right. Yeah. But, but I mean, we're not, you're not going to be able to go through the entire 100 and some acres of Harrison Park and, no. and, and save every ash tree. No. So we have to recognize there's going to be a significant loss of canopy and uh, look for ways to, to replace it not just in those areas, but throughout the city. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lemon? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, there are a number of species of ash. Are all ash equally susceptible? Unfortunately, yes. The only one that's showing uh, resistance is blue ash, and it's very, it basically only survives in a, an area, it's basically the hardiness zone 7A, which is down around uh, Windsor and a uh, little pocket at Niagara Falls. Um, I was told a number of years ago that it was a blue ash growing just outside of town on Park Street. I haven't been able to find it. Okay. So. The other question I've got, and this is, uh, affects planning. When we're doing, uh, we have a certain approved list of trees. At this point in time, adding additional ash to feed the <clears throat> insects would, is totally inappropriate. Uh, 
Is it, is our ash still on our approved list? Through you, Your Worship, Mr. Howard actually approves or reviews and signs off on landscape plans for developments and he wouldn't be recommending uh, landscape plans at this time with ash. We haven't formally removed the tree, but we're not seeing them proposed on plans. And what about the uh, various uh, nurseries that sell trees? Are they still selling ash? They're still selling them, but not many people are buying them based on that. And they can't ship them anywhere. Okay, I just was wondering about that. And there, there's no other chemicals around other than this one that... Not that's been approved in Canada for use. There's one in the States, but it has not got the efficacy that uh, triazin has. Okay, and the other thing was the natural predators, the insects that are predaceous. Uh, I know in other crops they have mass bred these and spread them so they can change the, the, the concentration very, very quickly. Is there any thoughts of, of uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources doing this? I believe it was in 2008 I received information um, to your worship um, that the uh, um, Owen Sound could be a site where they would actually give us um, um, some of these insects to breed. Um, it sounds pretty simple, uh, but the trouble is you have to have the insect here for them to feed on. So they are breeding them uh, in areas like in Toronto, Mississauga, and Oakville, um, the parasitic wasp spe uh, specifically. And they're found, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it is another parasitic uh, wasp which is native to the to, uh, to Canada, which is showing interest in the Emerald Ash Borer as well. Yeah, it just seems ironic that we've had the problem on land and in the water with exotic species, because it's a generation ago, basically, or a little more than that, where we lost our elms. And uh, <coughs> mind you, you're starting to see elm trees again. Mm -hmm. Councillor Wright. Thank you. Just to, out of curiosity, Mr. Howard, can you inject a tree before it has the emerald ash borer? Yes, you can. Um, how much before? Um, um, it, they, it's because it's only good for two years, so it's a bit of a, a waiting game. Um, and uh, it's best that you, you know, obviously you would, the insect would be there to start, or you know it's imminently going to be there. Um, but there have been locations where I've seen a company uh, and, and there's uh, the organization, I think it's uh, Grey Bruce uh, Forestry, um, they're going around inoculating trees and they've inoculated a few ash here in town, but um, I don't, I think myself personally, I think that's a little premature, so. What, what is the cost of inoculating each tree? It, on average, if, and if you could say such thing as an average ash tree, it'd be about $135. It's based on the diameter of the tree at what they call uh, breast height or chest height. So if somebody had a, a, an ash on their own property, could they call and have their tree yeah. injected? And they have done that in town. They have, yeah. okay. The, the, most, the one that was really in the papers was that uh, weeping English ash um, uh, on the uh, St. George's right. church property. Yeah, okay, thank you. Councillor Purden. Uh, yeah, I was just following up uh, a similar line of questions, whether you have treated any trees. I know the last time you were here or at a committee meeting, there was some concern about some of the very large uh, ash trees in the city that are special, I guess, special place in people's hearts as well. Yes. Uh, whether there's been any treatment or it's just a wait and see pattern at this time. It's more or less a wait and see because the uh, inventory is the first thing we want to get done and it's taking up a big chunk. And I'm hoping I got a little bit of money left that we'll be able to do some uh, treatments. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, again, it's, uh, I think if we can get through 2014 next year might be the year that we would start looking at mm -hmm. treatments, some of those what I call heritage trees. And I'd just like to echo Councillor Twaddle's remarks about getting a head start on encouraging the community to get busy with reforesting our urban forest, if there's ways of doing that mm -hmm. and mobilizing um, people in the community to do what they can do and if the city can help to make trees affordable or do what they need to do to promote tree planting, I think that's an excellent suggestion. 
Well, thank you very much for, uh, for the information and the presentation tonight. Uh, we do have, um, I don't believe we have a motion to receive the report would, it, would be in order of council, Councilor Twaddle. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you very thank much. You. And um, we will uh, certainly be paying close attention to that as the weeks and months go ahead. Oh, we have a report from the event facilitator, and this is regard with regards to the tall ship excursions. Now for something completely different. <laughs> I'm here to speak to the quality of life uh, component of uh, our economic development and uh, <laughs> tourism strategy. And since I'm here to talk about summer events, I thought I'd dress appropriately for the occasion. Uh, as you may observe, a council will be glad that I, I forego uh, putting on the uh, floppy straw hat and Hawaiian shirt, however. Um, but I do love Owen Sound, so I'm dressed for, with my, uh, my I Love Owen sh Sound shirt tonight. Uh, summer has begun, and our events have begun. Uh, every year, Owen Sound, the city, is, is very involved in helping to promote our special events. We've already heard about Busker Fest and Hottest Yard Sale tonight. We've seen on the consent agenda a whole bunch of events that are happening uh, throughout the summer and city parks. And uh, of course the city itself is involved in promoting events that are uh, free or uh, at uh, a low cost to the public. Uh, when a special opportunity comes along though, we like, to, we, take, we like to take advantage of that and Council has been supportive of the Tall Ships Initiative. First of all, last year with a completely sold out Tall Ships event as part of the uh, 1812 tour in Ontario. And this year uh, we have the opportunity to present one of our Tall Ships that visited us last year. They are back again this weekend. I can't believe that it's already here upon <laughs> us, but here we are. And uh, Leanna's Ransom will be in Georgian Bay offering excursions uh, this coming weekend. So Saturday, Sunday, and July 1st, Canada Day. So it's June 28th, June 29th, and Tuesday, July 1st, we will be offering the excursions. Uh, tickets are selling now. They are still available. We did not sell out in advance like we did last year, but they are, they are selling quickly. We're almost sold out on the, um, the 9 p.m. fireworks cruise on Tuesday, July 1st on Canada Day. I heard today there was only about six tickets left and they'll probably be gone by tomorrow morning. Uh, so if you, if you do intend to take an excursion, uh, please do get your tickets. Don't wait until the weekend because uh, we know that they're going to be selling really, really quickly. We will have tickets available if they do not sell in, in advance. We will have tickets available through the tourism office. So we're, so we're making provisions for that. We've got the staffing in place to do that and we have the, uh, the means to do that. So we're quite excited about this. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have the opportunity to host an authentic tall ship. Uh, one of the special things about this experience is that the crew actually dress like pirates and they tell stories about pirates and privateers. You, they even give passengers the opportunity to fire a cannon and dress up as pirates, as, uh, as your worship knows. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, so it's, it's well worth taking in. Uh, this is uh, one, of, one of many, many special events we have happening this summer. Our regular uh, events include the Harbor Nights Concert Series. We kicked that off last night with a terrific concert by Aaron McCallum. We had about 250 people present there at our first uh, concert. That's a really good uh, sign for the, uh, for the summer. I understand from our tourism staff that so there's a lot of inquiries coming in about uh, the Harbor Nights Series, a lot of recognition for it now in the community. And, and it's really gratifying to hear that. Uh, we also have a great big Canada Day celebration planned. Uh, some new activities taking part is uh, included in that. The RBC Grey Bruce uh, Youth Talent Showcase. Uh, we have uh, some inflatable attractions that are the kids will love and they are free. They're included with the price of admission this year. So some new things uh, to, uh, to occupy the kids. And again, getting back to the idea of, uh, uh, of not having incremental costs. You know, a family should be able to just pay one donation, whatever they can afford to come in and, and enjoy the day without any further costs. Uh, and also the evening concert will feature the award-winning, national award-winning Mackenzie Blues Band as our headline act. So lots of great things to look forward to there and lots of other great special events throughout the summer as has been documented in the Festivals and Events Guide. 
Uh, by the way, this, uh, this guide was uh, distributed to every mailbox in Owen Sound uh, through Canada Post, and uh, I know we've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. We've distributed quite a few extra through our tourism staff to uh, hotels and tourism outlets. In fact, we're almost out of them. So uh, um, treasure your copy and make sure you stick it up on your fridge to uh, see what's coming up and uh, enjoy this uh, fine summer that we're going to have here in Eno and Sound. Well, that's just great. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I'm sure we'll see all kinds of people at all of these events this summer. There is never a lack of things to do. <laughs> and uh, the beauty of it is we don't have to leave town. It's great. Exactly. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're most welcome. There's so much going on, it's hard to decide sometimes. Do you just sort of bounce from one thing to another? And uh, That's right. it is, uh, it's, we're, we're pretty lucky. We are very fortunate here to have so many things to do. We have now a report on the extension of a draft plan approval for Georgian Shores. What's Council's direction on this? Councillor Boddy. Uh, move the recommendation, which is to agree to extend uh, the draft plan approval for uh, development just outside the city. It had gone to uh, the, the gates of the OMB hearing a couple of years ago and was settled with a, uh, a plan to uh, move forward. And it appears that it's taken a little longer to get their plan in place. And it, uh, it makes sense to cooperate uh, and let them complete the plan in accordance with, uh, with their goal and, and ours. Good neighbors indeed. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. We have a report from the Director of Community Services with regards to the Community Foundation of Gray Bruce resolution supporting <clears throat> Pathways to Education Fund. Councillor Chamberlain? Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, recommend, the, um, approve this recommendation. And I also would like to speak um, and congratulate them on their 20th year. This is their anniversary for 20 years. And I think most people would be aware that our Community Foundation Grey Roof started right here in this council chamber under the uh, mayorship of um, Ova Jackson and uh, under the city manager then was um, Mr. Love. And uh, I think one of the first presidents was Arlene Wright of our Community Foundation. And it's come forward very, very well and uh, we are looking forward to helping them celebrate their 20th anniversary and helping uh, them um, get into this area of um, doing scholarships as the, and as the report says. So we're, we have no financial commitment, but we have a promotional commitment. And that's what to I'd be like clear. To, to be clear. To be clear. To this be is clear. not a request for financial support. This is a request for support in yes. principle right. and endorsement of the, the concept. Yes. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. We have a report from the Manager of Planning and Heritage with regards to the final subdivision approval for the East Ridge Business Park. Yeah. Council's direction on that. Councillor Purden. Well, this is a great recommendation um, to finalize the um, reference plan uh, and give notice of final approval. Did I make that motion? Okay. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's very exciting. And uh, they're moving forward with uh, great speed. Manager of Planning and Heritage, this is with regards to the development charges study, which we're required to do, and a critical path uh, with some timelines and so on. Um, apparently, we need an ad hoc committee. Councillor Twaddle. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the last time we did the development charges study, the, the lead committee was operations. Um, I don't have an objection to an ad hoc committee. I would just recommend that um, representatives from the Operations Advisory Committee and the uh, <coughs> Community Planning and Heritage Advisory Committee be included. They're the two areas where they're the most, the most impact. And I'd certainly be happy to sit on this committee again. Okay. 
Uh, discussion, Councillor Lemon. Well, one of the major players in this should be economic development. Uh, our objective is to get more development in the city, and that is the charge of economic development. So clearly, they should be involved as well. You can argue almost every council committee has some role in this. And I think it's, uh, I think an ad hoc committee is certainly a good idea, but I don't think it should be controlled by any one committee of council. It should, in fact, represent a broad range of interests, which includes economic development. It includes planning. It includes uh, uh, certainly operations, but I think you want to have a holistic approach rather than a narrowly focused approach. Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. A question, uh, and perhaps Councillor Twaddle, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the last two times I was in, this has gone on that I've been involved, was it not operations that this went through? Yes. Yeah, it, it, operations was the lead committee, and there were presentations to Council, but the preliminary work was done at, at operations. I believe the rationale for that was, was that most, not all, but most of the capital projects that would be funded in part through development charges, so the growth-related capital will be projects that come through operations. It just seems to me if it's worked, it seemed to work fine the last two times I was involved. I don't know why we would change the process now. But. Are there members of council who have a burning desire to sit on this particular ad hoc committee? Uh, as a person on both operations and economic development, yes, I would be interested because we have to be very, very careful with development charges that we don't get so far carried away that we reduce the amount of development. I would be interested in working on that committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's Council's direction? Councillor Adair. I was just going to agree with uh, Councillor McManaman that the last few times we've done this, I don't know that there was anything wrong with the process that it needs to be changed. The Operations Committee did a, a, a good job and that committee will not be setting the development charges, this council will be setting development charges based on accurate information. They're not fudging the numbers, the numbers come to us. They do the research, bring the numbers to us, and we decide what we want to do. City Manager. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, we didn't mean to make this controversial <laughs> request in any way. Um, I, w I would just comment that I think the development charges process in Owen Sound has matured over time. Mm -hmm. And it, like most municipalities, started with a very um, hard surface um, focus, if you will, so road, sewer, water. Um, it will expand now. Um, so we are looking for members of council for that committee. Um, we did recognize that operations currently has a very heavy workload. Um, so it was not meant out of any disrespect to have an ad hoc committee. Mm -hmm. It's simply a recognition that we're covering probably every uh, facet of the municipality for this study. Um, and given the workload of operations, we thought you should at least consider an ad hoc committee. Sure. Thank you very much. Further discussion on this? Councillor Purden. Th thank you very much, City Manager, for the uh, explanation of why. Uh, I, I do agree. I think it's a, a good idea to have an ad hoc committee. Um, and if you're struggling for membership, I would sit on it if that's needed or desired. Well, what would Council like to do? Councillor Wright. I just want to know that I do not want to sit on it. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wright. <laughs> Nor do I. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Councillor Lemon. Uh, I think it would be appropriate to make a, a motion that an ad hoc committee be struck, and I would so move. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, uh, an ad hoc committee to be struck and the membership to be determined. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Uh, I would encourage members of council that are really keen on that to, uh, to co consider uh, membership and let the um, acting director of operations know about that.
Councillor Boddy. I'm, I'm terribly confused. We apparently we've just assigned an ad hoc committee. Don't know how it, how we're going to appoint members. How many? Councillor Lemon has just informed me that because he moved it, that automatically means that he's on it. Councillor, uh, I didn't know that was the rule, but I'm trying to figure out: are we going to have a committee of six, a committee of two? I think maybe we've got a little more discussion to go through here before we. Uh, go too much farther forward. Well, Councillor Boddy, I'm all ears and I've been asking for a direction and this is all we're getting. Yes, so uh, if you have some direction, Councillor Boddy, put it on the table. That's what we're here to do. You have some, you have some, Councillor Wright. I will put a motion on the floor following that, that the ad hoc committee come from the operations department, operations committee. Okay, well, we've already voted, so that can be your... That's my additional motion. Okay. Clear on the motion to the motion. Councillor Lemon. Uh, I do not think that's appro appropriate. There are other parts of planning and uh, economic development which should be also involved in my estimation. If you could clarify the motion, Councillor Wright. My motion says that the members of the ad hoc committee come from the operations committee. Seems clear. Questions to the motion, discussion. Uh, Councillor McManaman and then Councillor Twaddle. You didn't, no. Oh. Councillor Twaddle. So that would make the ad hoc committee Councillor Lemon, Councillor McManaman and myself as the three council reps on operations. I'm speaking against it because I think <coughs> we should be, uh, if there's a counselor on planning, I, I think that's important. Well, I, I would just point out that Councillor McManaman and I both sit on the planning committee. And Peter, you're on economic development. Councillor Boddy, did you want to wrap that up? No, I was just going to suggest we call the vote. I think we all understand it now, maybe. If it's not, a, put up your hand if you're still confused, anybody. It's a good, good, good question. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Moving along, we have a report from the Environmental Superintendent. Oh, do a motion to accept the critical path. Approve. Councillor Lemon. I would move we approve the critical path. All those in favor? Opposed. That's carried. We have a report from the Environmental Superintendent with regards to Energy Conservation Demand Management Plan, and I see our uh, Environmental Superintendent, Mr. Hughes, is here this evening. Uh, welcome, Mr. Good Hughes. Thank you. Good evening, for Your Worship. Councillor. this report. I'm pleased to see you're already embracing energy conservation by keeping the air conditioning down. Yeah, very, we've noticed. Very proud. Um, <laughs> the uh, Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan is a requirement of the Green Energy Act of uh, Regulation 397.11. Uh, it has to be uh, uh, sent to the Ministry of Environment, or sorry, Ministry of Energy, and posted on our website by July 1st in order to. Uh, stay within the guidelines. Uh, the purpose or the, the goal is the uh, Ministry of Energy would like to um, see municipalities, hospitals, all sort of public sector reduce their energy use as a way of uh, rather than having to build more infrastructure, more transmission lines, uh, we can certainly save a lot of energy by reducing energy use in the public sector. Uh, the city is also uh, reporting on energy use uh, as of July 1st uh, each year. We started last year reporting on 2011. This year we're reporting on 2012. Um, as part of the conservation and demand management plan, we require a, uh, a, a commitment from council by way of a resolution. Uh, we've the the energy plan is looking at a modest uh, reduction in energy use of 10% over five years. 4% uh, of this we're anticipating will be through the uh, conversion of the street lights to LED technology. Uh, we're currently waiting on uh, real term energy to come back to us uh, probably in mid-July with a, uh, a final contract. They're right out 
out right now doing a street light count and they'll give us a contract based on the, the actual number of street lights. Uh, energy costs have increased about 42% from 2005 to 2012, uh, from 1.2 million to approximately 1.7 million. Uh, this is almost exclusively due to increased electricity use. The, uh, the cost of natural gas has remained fairly steady over that period. The um, energy plan uh, proposes Excuse a Excuse me for a minute, Mr. Hughes. Yeah. Councillor Twaddle. Yeah, just, just, you said the increase was due to increased electricity use or increased electricity cost? Use and cost. Use and cost, yeah. thank you. The, the, that financial figure came directly from the financial services. We don't have, we haven't tracked energy use going back to 2005. We're back as far as 2006 and we need to track all the accounts. This is, that's, so that, that's basically a billing summary, that 1.2 to 1.7, that's just what we paid them. Uh, the energy plan is uh, proposing a two-pronged approach, uh, adopting technological changes and <coughs> upgrades where uh, practical and possible, and encouraging uh, managers and staff to take a greater role in energy management. <coughs> the, um, the report uh, and the energy plan um, suggests that in order to manage our energy use, it needs to be something that is done in all departments across the corporation. It's not practical or feasible to, to say to one person, you are going to control the energy. Because it's used in every facility and it's really uh, it's the individual managers in charge of those facilities need to take ownership of their, their energy use. So we have made some gains uh, over the, uh, since we started this in about 2008, 2009. Uh, we have done some energy audits of uh, some of our facilities. Uh, this year we've uh, completed changing over the sewage treatment plant from uh, electricity to natural gas. That's not strictly an energy saving because you're just changing the, the form. However, it is certainly a, a money saving move. The, uh, we've also uh, upgraded the um, heating system at the, um, the Bayshore Arena. Uh, there was another recommendation there that, uh, that hasn't been acted on that's quite uh, potentially savings. Unfortunately, the, um, when they did the upgrade of the arena, uh, expanded it for the attack, um, the, every, all the heat in the lobby goes up the two staircases and into the arena itself. So you're now you're, you're fighting with the ice plant by uh, doing that. So the, there was a recommendation that we put in some doors, either top or bottom, to prevent, keep the heat in the lobby and keep the cold in the arena. We also need to, uh, it's called an energy conservation demand management plan. Uh, electricity demand is the amount of, is, is the speed at which you use electricity. So when, rather than just cutting down the amount of electricity used, we need to cut, shave the, our peak energy use. An example is uh, the motors at the, the pumps at the uh, water treatment plant. If you turn them all up, up at once, you end up with a peak and you will pay more for that entire month. So if you either use soft starts on all those motors or phase them in, then you can save money and electricity. Uh, we're suggesting uh, some further audits, energy audits. Uh, the police, uh, station, the fire station, the library and the art gallery are all uh, significant energy users and we haven't done an, an audit of those in some time. And I think that's uh, the other uh, recommendation is that we uh, uh, move forward on imp implementing the recommendations of uh, previous uh, energy audits. Uh, this building itself, we had a, um, a, a walkthrough audit done by LAS at no cost. Uh, one of the things they found is that the uh, the parapet that hangs around the building that sticks out all around the top is not insulated. So the heat that in the building goes, a lot of it just simply leaks out up there. Uh, in summary, uh, if you look at the, uh, the table, the uh, graph on page three of our energy costs, it's uh, I've summed it up by uh, it's either pay now and do some upgrades and reduce our energy use or pay more later. 
because energy costs themselves are going to rise and our, certainly our energy use is, is rising. Thank you. Any uh, questions? Councillor Chamberlain. Yes, I just spent quite a bit of time. I have relatives in the consulting business around energy audits and a lot of conversations. Their um, contracts with two municipalities have to do with involving the whole community in an educational component so that the whole community can understand better for their own purposes as well. And I just suggest that as we go forward with this, we might like to bring um, the public a little bit more aware of what's going on with energy because that would be especially with everybody being concerned about their own hydro bills and gas bills, that might be a way that we could involve some community engagement in this piece. And, Certainly. Uh, yes. So I would be look forward to the, the different consultants that we're working with and what they're t telling us to do. There's <coughs> Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. So the Green Energy Act says we must have this plan in place by July 1st. Yes. Um, the. Uh, there's no penalties associated with this regulation. Hmm. So it's not there actually the Ministry of Energy hasn't promised to review these energy plans. There's going to be more than 400 of them. It's simply, they're simply saying you have to post it on the website and you have to send them a copy. Yeah, yeah, I think we all would agree that energy conservation is a, and having a plan for that is a, is a good idea. My concern is with this current plan, um, it lays out, well, just, I mean, even the motion. Uh, the council resolves to allocate necessary resources. What does that mean? And if you read the plan, there's, you know, uh, maybe a dozen or so uh, items that, you know, the doors at the Bayshore were one of them. Um, if we're putting that in our plan and we're by resolution saying we are resolving to allocate the necessary resources, it would seem to indicate that. You know, maybe the dozen's the wrong number. Whatever number is in that plan that we're hoping to, that we're going to do it. That well, we have an energy an target of, of 10% over five years. Right, and so I, I think there needs to be more work done on the specifics of how you're going to get there uh, in 2014 budget, in 2015 budget, in 20, you know. Um, I, I, anyway, I, I just think this should be referred at least to the operations committee for a plan of action. Um, if we're going to post it on our website, I, I think it would be reasonable for the citizens to think we're going to actually do something about it. And um, uh, as it stands right now, I'm not sure we are. Um, without some concrete plan in place to say in 2014, we're taking forward to budget, we do those doors at the base. Or in 2015, we fix the parapet that's leaking. <laughs> Uh, it, that's not not specifically a requirement of no the, fair of enough the, and, and I yeah. understand what you're saying you're saying there's no penalties fair enough but if we're going to say we're going to reduce it by 10 percent well I think if we're going to say that we should actually have a plan, have a plan to mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. um, or, or not or, or just not say we're going to do it that would be another option but it appears we have to have a plan in place so uh, where you go from here I, I mean if we have to have one by July 1st I guess we have to have one but I think there needs to be I guess I would say we need to refer to operations for a more detailed analysis of how an implementation plan, maybe that's the that's, word I think. That's a good word. So, change anyway, those are my, well, if, and I would, I'm not entirely happy with the recommendation either, as Councillor Wright has just said. So I, 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 I guess one of the issues is that we don't know, until we do energy audits of, say, the police station, we don't know what the recommendations are going to be. So doing the energy audits is a first step. We have some of the recommendations from previous audits. We're not going to do them all anyways, because some of them have paybacks of, well, for example, we could replace this building has single pane windows throughout. The, the payback is probably around 30 to 40 years, because it's expensive to put double glazed windows in it, especially this size. So even though we know that's necessary, we're not, doesn't mean we have to do it. So it, it's still, it, let's just say there's no requirement in here that we do everything that is recommended from an audit. I just, in, uh, is it 10 years? Is that the plan? Is it's a five year. Five, in five years, whoever's sitting around this council table, if they're going to say, okay, so you've implemented this plan on June 23rd, 2014, or five years later, what have you done? <laughs> and if the answer is going to be um, nothing, nothing uh, 
you know, then I think we should just not do anything right now <laughs> if our plan is. There's, there's certainly to room for something. annual uh, review. Right, and I, I think, and I agree with that. I just think there should be an annual plan. Maybe that's what an implementation plan. We've got some more speakers to this, uh, Councillor uh, Purden. I think this is a really good start. Uh, I think we need uh, an overall vision and a few numbers to get started. This is the first time, this is where we're starting. And I think the five years and 10% is a very modest approach. I like very much in this plan the idea that each department looks at where they can be addressing energy efficiency and improving energy use because there's a lot of really good people within our organization who, if they are um, directed by a plan like this to start thinking about energy conservation, that that will start to um, build the plan as it goes along. I don't disagree, Councilman McManaman, that an implementation strategy is a really important piece, but I think this is more in the line of a general framework. Uh, and I think um, if, we, uh, if we do uh, adopt this plan, not just because it needs to be posted by the 1st of July, but because as a council, we believe that we need to do and can do more around energy conservation, then that will direct us at council level, at staff level, at each budget meeting, at each committee to be looking at energy efficiency and how we're improving things. So I, I see this as more as an overarching uh, plan that just sets some targets and I think they're quite modest. Um, when you look through those charts in detail, you see there's lots of room for improvement. Uh, and some of them may not even be things that are going to require big capital expenditures or anything like that. It'll be in the line of changing habits, uh, changing our way of thinking, off-peak use of electricity, for example, lots of those types of things. So I think it's a good start, and I do agree that an implementation plan is part, is the next step, and it'd be quite, you know, we can direct staff to take it the next step, but I think this is a good recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Twaddle, then Councillor Chamberlain. We don't have a motion. No. No. <clears throat> I, I was going to, based on Councillor McManaman's comments, I was going to suggest a different recommendation. Just that in consideration of the staff report respecting the energy conservation and demand management plan, Council approves the plan in principle mm -hmm. and refer the plan to the Operations Advisory Committee to develop an implementation plan and that the implementation plan be reviewed on an annual basis. So That seems like a reasonable approach, but I shouldn't say that. Councillor Chamberlain, <laughs> it's a motion on the floor. Well, well, I'll support that, but I was wondering about our, we already have some solar panels in and going in. Do they, do they impact on this as well? Because that will change some of our energy use. They don't. The solar, plans, solar, solar panels we have in place don't power our own facilities. That's right, we're selling. They feed into the grid. So they do want you to discuss your solar or your alternative energy production in the plan, but it doesn't subtract from our, our usage. And I still say that this might be a really good place to involve some community, uh, well, call them partners, but people in the community who are, are good with this, it would give us some suggestions. It might be a good engagement piece to work around this with, our, with the operations committee. So I'll support that motion. Okay, further discussion, Councillor Lemon. Well, there are some areas, uh, one which I brought up and uh, I'm hoping that we will look at it through operations and that is we currently burn off methane gas at the sewage treatment plant because we have no storage capacity, then we buy natural gas to uh, heat it up, heat the uh, waste up uh, at a later time. There are ways like this, and example, we're still not using all the heat out of the bay shore uh, generated by the compressors. Uh, we have, I think, an area that we have to look at is controlling. Example, I've been past uh, St. George's Park when there's nobody there and the lights are on. You, Councillor Lemon, I think you're hitting the nail on the head on a few areas, and I know that uh, operations, you're, you're part of operations, yes, are I you am. not? I'm sure that you will be But some of it's within parks and rec <laughs> purviews, et cetera. And sure. we have to 
we have to think broadly, but I also support strongly Councillor Chamberlain's suggestion of involving the community because we see what we see. Other people in the community may see things that we're doing that we're not aware we're doing. And uh, I really believe some public engagement on this would be a terrific idea because it makes everyone aware of energy conservation. I'm sure it'll be unanimous. Everybody will want to save money. Councillor Adair. <clears throat> well, I just wanted to echo what Councillor Purden said. This, this is the first step. We have some energy audits to mm -hmm. do before we um, yeah. get uh, too far ahead of us ourselves by saying we're going to be putting doors somewhere or we're going to be involving the public. We need to do our audit so we know what, what the issues yeah. are. So um, I said I, I agree with Councillor Purden. We, this, this is a framework to start with. Yep. And let's start from there. Thank you very much for your report. Uh, to the motion, all those, you had a comment? I just, just wanted to clarify one comment, Councillor Lemons, is that we do currently use the methane in the wastewater treatment plant to heat the digester. We will continue to do that, but there are times when, particularly in the summer, when we produce more methane than is required to run the plant, and you cannot store methane. It, it has to be used. So there's, uh, no, there's no ability to, there's no ability to store methane gas. It has to be used, and that's and that's the process. And the new, the new plan for the new for the upgraded system, um, we will still result in the need to flare off some of the gas if we, if depending on the number of digesters and the temperature of the influent. I'm well aware of the conditions, and I presented. Uh, to Matt Prentice, who was looking into it because other communities are storing their methane. Methane can be, there are special tanks that are built to hold methane gas, and it's being done in other municipalities. Good discussion. How about Councillor Purden? I'm um, just, I think this is a really good start for the city. I said that already. I'm a little worried about it going to operations and getting, uh, like, instead of it getting bigger and more thinking and thinking across the whole organization that it gets narrowed down. Um, I'd like to find some way, e either through engagement with the public or experts or other parts of the organization to keep the implementation strategy looking broadly and forward. And I think operations is a committee that often is dealing with the more tangible um, things. It's, it's a plan, I think, that's more of a vision or closely related to a vision and needs that kind of energy in the implementation as well, not to get too focused all of, at once. So I just with throw that out. I don't, we don't have any other place for uh, an implementation plan. At one time we had an environmental committee um, that was disbanded because it didn't have much to do, I don't think, and now it would be a good place to put a project like this. Certainly, uh, perhaps the next term of council, there'd be an opportunity to do so. Uh, at this point, I think it would be uh, a little bit of a moot point. And I think that uh, this is a good first step, as you've, uh, to use your words. It's a good first step. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thanks very much Thanks for very the report. Much. And I will look forward to the implementation of many of those, and I'm sure a lot of other creative suggestions that'll come forward as well. There's uh, four sets of uh, boards and committees for approval. Councilor McManaman. Thank you, Worshipal. Thank you, Worshipal. I'll move the minutes. Two questions, or one question and one comment. On the um, Cultural Advisory Committee minutes, uh, right near the end, it talks about the old City Hall bells and clock face. And I'm just wondering, um, it asks the Council give approval, but then it says in, in uh, city facilities such as, um, I guess it's asking for approval, but it doesn't say where or, or how or, um, well, not the how, I guess, but I'm just so, I don't, I don't know. I'll go to the chair of, uh, of the Cultural Advisory Committee and uh, we'll see what we get. And then if we need to, we'll, we'll uh, get some help from staff. Councillor Purden. Yes. 
the st staff can certainly help me out with this. My understanding uh, is uh, that uh, there have been already connections made at uh, the Julie MacArthur Regional Recreation Centre for um, hanging Billy Bishop's plane, plane mm -hmm. and that that is structurally possible and doable and desired. Uh, and they were looking at the Bay Shore as the location for the Bells. I'm not sure if that was all the Bay Shore and Julie MacArthur both being considered for that. There was no decision on that, but there was discussion on that. I know that there's quite a move to, uh, to celebrate and, and showcase those pieces rather than having them tucked away, but uh, maybe I'll go to the city manager just to uh, flesh out a little bit of the detail around uh, where the Bells will be and <laughs> so on. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, very exciting projects for the city. We've had uh, uh, the bells and mothballs for many, many years um, sitting at the county, so this is an opportunity to showcase the old clock tower bells uh, within our facilities. Currently, we are looking at the Julie McCarthy Regional Recreation Center for that. Um, there's a stairway there where they could tuck in sort of uh, behind that quite nicely. Uh, and be displayed. It's a bit of a dead space now. Um, and the hanging of the, the airplane is another very exciting one. And we've gone so far as to, um, uh, in our, what we call our job seat committee, which is with the, the Y, to have further discussions on that. I can tell you that our architects are donating uh, their time and expertise to make sure that that is done uh, appropriately. So two That's very great. exciting projects. Yeah. Super. Really, really a fun, a fun use of the, uh, the heritage features from the community and uh, great to showcase them in, in new facilities where they'll be well, well seen. Councillor Purden and Councillor Lemon. Just one further comment to the bells, which we did talk about at the Cultural Committee, is that actually bells are meant to be heard. And uh, a future project could be to find some way of have the bells ringing in Owen Sound again. <laughs> it would be a rather expensive uh, idea. We did throw out the idea at the Cultural Committee um, about maybe that being um, uh, for the 150th birthday of, of uh, Canada that we would hear bells in Owen Sound. So that's just a thought to th think. Okay, very good. Councillor Lemon. John, I think it's a great idea because the bells are ours uh, and the museum has stored them for us. Uh, the one caution, I, and I hate to sound like a worry wart, but we lost one of the bells before. <laughs> uh, we had to buy it back. I remember that distinctly. Uh, and I'm assuming that if we do put them on display, that would mean such a way that there is no way that we're going to lose another bell. I, I just think they're too precious to just sort of hang there. I'm assuming there'll be some protection. If I could, Your Worship, through to Councillor Lemon. I don't know if you've ever tried to move one of those bells. Um, they're pretty heavy, but regardless, we'll make sure that they are secure. Councillor McManaman. Thank you. Well, just to wrap that up, I think it's a, a great idea. Just if you could keep us updated on the specifics of the bells. <laughs> Sounds funny saying it. Um, <laughs> Big issue. <laughs> <It's a laughs> ding dong. The other. Um, <laughs> The other comment I had to worship was one from the Parks and Recreation Committee, and I would just highlight tonight we would be, uh, if Council does approve it, the renaming of the unnamed park on 2nd Avenue uh, A West in honor of uh, Corporal Robert T. James Mitchell. So I just didn't want that to pass without mentioning Thank that you. to the public that that would be. And at some point in August, we will hopefully be having some sort of a public uh, unveiling. And, and dedication. Ca dedication, thank yeah, you. Dedication. That's a better word. Uh, and Councillor Wright has noted uh, we, in the report it talks about uh, cleaning the park up. We would be trimming the trees back. It uses another word that. Limbing. Limbing the trees. <laughs> Trimming is the word I think we're looking at. So. We'll trim Pruning. the limbs. Pruning, that's even better. Yes. That's the correct term. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor. Anyway, those are all my comments. Thank you, Worship. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions on any of the uh, boards and committee minutes for approval? Seeing none, that was moved by Councillor McManaman. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. We have one set of in-camera City Council minutes from June 9th. Moved by Councillor Wright. All those in favor? 
Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. We, other business? Councillor Lemon. Well, uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1944, transit uh, came to Owen Sound. That's 70 years ago. And once we get the routes ironed out, uh, we want to try and get some of the ridership back that unfortunately we have lost. And I just want to plant a seed at this time that that might be an ideal celebration once that's done of our 70th anniversary of uh, transit within the city. Uh, there have been actually several different operations we've had, but it has been continuous since 1944. And no, I do not remember it, just in case you were going to ask. Um, but I think that is something I just want to put Council on notice that I think, uh, and I said on operations, and I'm going to try and see if with some way we can create some really fantastic publicity to get some focus on people coming back to transit who have, uh, are no longer uh, using the transit. But 70 years is an accomplishment. It certainly is. Thank you for bringing that forward and we'll stay tuned for more discussion on it. Thank you. And the other thing was, I'm trying to remember what it was. Pardon? Oh, oh elevator. right, that, yeah. It's a lift. Well, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's about as dependable as, I could think of a few things, but I won't do that. Uh, the problem being that uh, we have used, I believe, one company for a number of years doing the maintenance, and example, the door at the top does not close. In the basement, we get what's called ghosting, where you will mm -hmm. be in a meeting and there's nobody touching anything anywhere and the door opens and closes. Now, maybe we have spirits in City Hall, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, that's kind of spirit, but there, uh, there are other types of spirits. But anyway, I would, uh, I don't know that we need a motion for this, ask uh, for a report from the staff on the status of the elevator maintenance contract. I believe it has not been looked at for some time and possibly even contacting the company because of all the problems we're having. I'm sure the facilities manager can look into that through the, yes. So I, I did have an opportunity to contact the facilities manager um, and he advises that one of the main reasons we use this company is they have a very good reputation and they're a local company. Um, so we do save a fair amount of money because it's a reduction in travel time. Um, we certainly can bring a report back uh, expressing what the options are and whether you want to go out to an RFP or not. I like to keep it local as much as possible, but the problem is we have these recurring problems that have been going on and on and on for a number of years. Councillor, would you like a report back on options? Yes. Yes, that would be the, f the first step. And I I'm just wondering, uh, I noticed the name of the company that made the elevator, lift elevator, whatever you want to call it this week. Um, I'm wondering if at some point talking to them and seeing if they have any experience with this kind of problems in terms of their product. Okay, motion on the floor. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed? Can I get some votes? Was everybody in favor? Okay then. <laughs> Motion is passed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Councillor Wright. <laughs> oh, thank you. I just, um, uh, I, I attended the health and safety fair and I, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> And I just wanted to say that I thought our staff did a super job of setting that up. It was, yeah. it was great. Now, I didn't get there till about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and it had been running since 11 o'clock. I'm quite sure it was very well attended, but uh, those that uh, I hope most of the staff got there because it was very, very worthwhile and very um, um, informative and educational. And... Uh, enjoyable as well. So they, they did a good job. We'd please pass on 
to the people that were responsible that it was a great show. Council, or city manager, please. So, so just, council, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but this was our HR department and our health and safety committee. So the accolades go to those two groups. So we will certainly pass that on. Super, thank you so much. Councillor Chamberlain. <clears throat> yes, I would like to com compliment the group that has, um, well, I guess it's the Waterfront Heritage Museum group. They are, even this evening while we were at council, they were having their first AGM. That's the group that is now running the former M Marine and Rail Museum. And this Saturday, June the 28th, is when they open. And they will be fully uh, functional and open for the long weekend for us all to attend that. So I want to congratulate them. And the other one was the, um, the DIA, the flowers are really looking good downtown, but they also have spent time this year concentrating on Third Avenue East. Mm -hmm. And there is a new community garden that has been put in together by the DIA on Third Avenue East, just behind the Scotia Bank. And I just think all of us uh, mm -hmm. are very lucky to have that happening in this community along with a lot of other community gardens, but I just want to compliment the DIA on that. Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. And just quickly, uh, just uh, remind council and invite the public for the uh, new skate skateboard park and bike park uh, grand opening, which is this weekend, this Saturday, at uh, 11 a.m. 11 till 1 up at the uh, at Victoria Park by beside the uh, rec center. Um, the uh, Kiwanis Club, uh, as we all know, is our is the major sponsor of that park, and uh, they are going to have hot dogs and drinks and free T-shirts for the first number of kids, 200 children, I believe. They're also having a uh, renowned skateboarder coming to Owen Sound to do a demonstration. So uh, anyway, that's this Saturday, June 28th, uh, 11 till one, up at the new Kiwanis Skate and Bike Park. I assume you're going to put on a demonstration as well. That'll be a, that'll be a fun event, and I'll, I'm sure that uh, Councillor Dare will have a skateboard with him. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Councillor Burden. Sorry, I forgot to mention that uh, this falls under the general category of so many things to do in Owen Sound, where do we start? Um, but if you want to start on Wednesday, all, Wednes all Wednesdays through the whole summer, there's a noon hour concert series that really celebrates um, uh, all kinds of musicians. Um, from 12 to 1, it's a pay by donation. Uh, Kira MacArthur and mm -hmm. David Sarita are playing this Wednesday mm -hmm. at Georgian Shores Church. Uh, and then Bob Hope, who sits on the operations committee and his group of folk musicians are all going to be playing the next Wednesday. And there's a string quartet, there's a piano concert, there's a whole every Wednesday. So if you feel like some nice music mm -hmm. and supporting local artists, go to Georgian Shores on Wednesdays from 12 to 1. It's a 12, new 12 to on 1. On Wednesdays. <laughs> it really looks like a great lineup. I, I was, yeah, a lot of fun. Um, oh, just uh, down to me now, and um, just putting it out to council, asking uh, the clerk's office if you could please poll council to determine an appropriate meeting date, either July the 8th or the 9th in the evening uh, for a meeting to make some decisions around transit and have the rubber hit the road, so to speak. Yeah, so the clerk will be in touch with each member of council to determine which date works best. Thank you. Motion the committee rise, please. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Uh, we're now from a session, a re resolution adopting proceedings in committee of the whole, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Twaddle, that the action taken in committee of the whole in considering public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given, and other business be confirmed by this council. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed, that's carried. Notice of motion, new business by resolution, bylaws. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Twaddle, that bylaws number 2014, 84, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 
109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, and 117 be passed and enacted. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried and we are now adjourned. Thank you.